What might New Zealand dairy farming look like in 2030? What strategies and technologies could Kiwi farmers adopt to get ahead of our global competitors, like US mega dairies? And what can we learn from some of those competitors? Well, Dairy NZ researchers are on the case, seeking answers to those questions and more through an exciting new levy-funded project called Frontier Farms. It's all about identifying the key challenges our farm systems need to address and coming up with solutions to remain globally competitive. In this episode, you'll hear from Dairy NZ senior scientist Dr Paul Edwards, who's heading Frontier Farms. Also with us is Lee Matheson, Managing Director at Perrin Ag, who led the first competitor analysis as part of the project. We're also thrilled to have Waikato dairy farmer Colin Hickey join us. Colin's one of the farmers giving input into farm system design. My name's Ben Chapman-Smith and this is episode 46 of Talking Dairy. And just a quick note that if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you get notified when new episodes go live. Guys, thanks so much for taking the time to come onto the podcast today. Paul, tell us a bit about yourself and what the New Frontier Farms project aims to do. What's the problem that you're trying to solve for farmers? Yeah, so I guess the Frontier Farms project we've been operating for uh, about 18 months now, and the objectives of the project really are about forecasting the attributes that a future farm would need to, to have to uh, maintain or improve our international competitiveness looking at that and saying, okay, to achieve that, let's co-develop some some technologies and model farm systems to deliver on those attributes that we'd need to have, and then take that to the next level and actually test those those technologies and model farm systems out in, in some demonstrations, sort of taking the risk of, you know, when you do new systems, things won't work out as planned, and, and sharing those learnings, uh, refining those systems and sharing those learnings along the way. So, and ultimately that's working towards uh, that we have profitable and sustainable farm systems that are ahead of the, the sort of 2030 type horizon frontier of where we think our international competitors are going to be. In terms of the project itself, there's kind of three main work streams that let us deliver on those objectives. One is, a, is around an analysis of our global competitors. Um, and that, that's the bit that sort of really helps frame up where we think we might need to be. And then go through a, a, a co-design exercise with farmers and rural professionals and, and kind of work out, well, what are those things that we're going to need to do to deliver on that? And then the, the sort of physical demonstration aspect in terms of running some of these farm systems and, and seeing how they perform. Mm, sure. Hey, Colin, great to have you with us. Tell the listeners where, you, where you're farming. So, uh, yeah, so we, we farm North Waikato, a little place called Waitaremu. It's um, my wife and two kids. And I've got my father that lives on the farm as well. So he's a, he's a great help. So we milk uh, jerseys across two properties. Uh, both herds uh, winter milk once a day. And we focus on the high BW jerseys to um, add some resilience to our to our business. Yeah, also enables us the opportunity now and again to um, produce a bull for breeding purposes. So, Hey, Colin, how, how are you involved in this project and why did you want to be part of it? Yeah, so Paul Edwards contacted me. I've known Paul for a number of years and... He understands how much I enjoy strategic planning, blue sky thinking, so thought I'd be of value. But I also thought it was really important to really make sure that the research that is done is done with a um, forward-facing mind of, with farmers that are part of it that deal with the information at the coalface. So yeah, apart from meeting up a couple of times and a, and a few emails, it takes up very little time because we're already thinking about it. Uh, I think every farmer in New Zealand is probably thinking about what's happening tomorrow and in the future. But it's really exciting to collaborate with other people who are thinking 10, 15, 20 years ahead and what might be possible and what we should be doing today to um, to plan for the future and what may or may not happen. You know, we don't have a crystal ball, but we've got opportunities to to look at trends that are happening and probabilities that might occur. Good one. Lee, what's your role in the project? Well, someone's going to do some of the work, Ben, so I guess that's part of what I'm here for. <laughs> so, look, um, Paul Paul tapped us on the shoulder um, back in February or February of last year, I think it was, and asked us to help out with um, undertaking the competitor analysis of the New Zealand dairy industry with, with the US mega dairy industry. So we put our, um, put our thinking caps on and trawled a lot of stuff to try and understand what those differences were between our systems both now um, and, and into the future. 
um, mainly in, you know, around those key attributes of what makes our, our dairy systems work and how and how different things in the environment actually can impact impact on the, um, the ability of those farms to be successful as, as these things change. Can you define mega dairy for us? Yeah, so what we're talking about when we use the term mega dairy is, in the US sense anyway, is, is pretty much a, a farm that has, has give or take 2,000 plus cows um, in its farm system being milked um, during the year. And in a, in a US sense, what we're really talking about is what our listeners and what our farmers would probably think about as being a pretty industrialized image of farming. So think cows being indoors in barns all year round or confined in big feedlots outside and getting getting milk three times a day, being milked all year round, and, and pretty importantly from our perspective in New Zealand, being fed a diet that doesn't include any grass. Sure. So if we look ahead to 2030, 2040, what advantages could US mega dairies have over Kiwi dairy farmers? Yeah, great, great question. And we, we probably identified sort of three or four key things. Um, there are lots of things that New Zealand farms probably have over US farms, and we'll hopefully talk about those later on. But in terms of where, where they've probably got the edge on us, you know, looking out to that 2030, 2040 time horizon, certainly they have, they have some big advantages, we think, in terms of the ability then to automate their systems and use the technology that, that's, that's being developed in the dairy sector. Um, and that has a big flow on effect into their ability to attract and retain labour and their, their ability to compartmentalise labour in terms of the roles and responsibilities they have is a lot easier than in a New Zealand farm system. They've probably got the ability to better manage their environmental footprint compared to us. So, you know, they, you know, the typical dairy farm in New Zealand might be 130, 140, 150 hectares of which a farm has to manage its environmental footprint. In the US mega dairy system, we're talking about a farm size that might be you know, 15 to 20 hectares in size. We've got animals indoors, we're able to manage manure. We can probably even manage manage greenhouse gases a bit better when we've got animals inside and we can capture the methane. So, so that ability to manage environmental externalities is an area where we think they probably have the edge over us. Uh, and they also have the ability, probably more so than we do, to really manage, optimise their productivity and manage their cost of production. The scale of those, of those sectors around genetic gain, their ability to optimise feed, feed rationing is, is a lot better than our New Zealand pastoral farming system. And, and in reality, they just have the ability to really maximise economies of scale when they have a very small physical footprint and the ability to produce large amounts of milk in a, in a short space of time. Mm. So what do Kiwi farms, dairy farms, need to do to better compete with these US mega dairies? Oh, well, for, for, yeah, another great question. Look, really, it's actually to address, address those key things. So we've identified sort of three main areas where the US possibly has the edge. So we just have to work out how do we address those within the limits of our farming systems because we've been blessed with, 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 a, with, with, with sunshine and, and, and water and, and grass and we have to really optimise those to be, to be profitable. We've got to manage those externalities too. So there were sort of three main priority areas that we identified through this analysis. So the first one was New Zealand farmers, we've just got to keep reducing our so-called environmental hoof print Right, so we've got to improve our ability to operate sustainably while we produce milk. So, you know, producing more for less. We've certainly got to improve our labour efficiency, but we've got to do that in a way that doesn't compromise our output or equally importantly, the working conditions of people who work in our farms. I mean, you talk to most farmers at the moment, their number one challenge is, is, is often finding and um, retaining the people in their farming system. So we've got to really absolutely put a, a high focus on that and work out how we continue to keep our farm businesses attracting people to work in and how we make, make them a great place to, to be, be part of. And then lastly, we have to really just keep putting pressure on our, on our core cost of production. So, you know, we are at the moment and will continue to be an export focused business. Our ability to remain profitable as we're exposed to the global milk prices is, is, is pretty important. And certainly the big focus for us really needs to be on keeping our cost of production really low. You know, aside from that also, Ben, we also have to really think about how we amplify or leverage the things that we have up our sleeve that the US don't have. You know, so we've potentially got a real competitive advantage around perceptions around the quality of life we offer our cows, uh, the fact that our cows are free range and the fact that our cows are grass fed. So we absolutely need to focus on how do we regain or at least 
maintain competitiveness with the US in those first three areas, but we've also got to work out how do we do that without also compromising things that we do really well. Yeah, that's, that's great. Hey, Colin, can I bring you in? How important do you think it is uh, for us to address the challenges from, from US mega dairies? Yeah, US mega dairies are, are interesting. I, I, I really think that they aren't competitors. I really want to think that we can position ourselves in a different market, different customers that want different things. From a scientific point of view, I'm sure they have some similarities around, around all the stuff the scientists talk about. But from a consumer's point of view, I don't actually think they are too big a, too big a uh, threat. However, in a global market that requires cost-effective food and with the risks of famines and, and wars that are breaking out, we really need to be aware of our place in the world and that we can sell our product. So in that regard, we need to make sure that we follow the trends of having a social license to farm and making sure that we are ahead of the game at all times. So, Paul, you know, we've been discussing these challenges. How is Frontier Farms planning to address them? In terms of how we respond to this in the Frontier Farms project, we took Lee's analysis and pulled a workshop together with a set of a group of farmers and RPs to kind of digest those results and work out what, if anything, we need to do in, in terms of developing new systems to, to address those challenges. I and mean, I guess an important piece of context there that I think Lee touched on, but it is about utilising, drawing on our strengths as well. So it's not saying that mm -hmm. we want to kind of replicate US mega dairy systems in New Zealand. This is about, okay, their system lets them achieve this. How can we do that with our New Zealand unique New Zealand flavour to achieve a similar result? So yeah, we got together uh, and kicked around these these results, and the kind of key workshop outcome was setting a goal around flattening the peak demands in workload. So that being what across the year. So you know, for example, we do have a peak in workload around spring with calving and mating, and how can we kind of flatten that that demand out so we could operate more efficiently, as well as looking within a day as well, where milking creates these kind of big peaks of workload within the day. So what were all our options to tackle that? And the two kind of flagship ideas that came through, amongst a whole lot, a whole lot of other good ideas that we we're also exploring as well. But the two kind of flagship ideas were extended lactation in terms of minimising the number of calves and cows being born each year and, and, and flattening that, that out, as well as batch robotic milking in terms of flattening out that, that work demand within a day. And so I guess adding a bit more detail to both of those answers, so the, the extended lactation, the kind of system that was discussed at the meeting and, and sort of subsequently backed up by some modelling, it was a one with a 24-month calving interval where half of the herd would calve each year. So you sort of, it's not... Um, that all the cows calve in one year and then not in the next because that also then still has a peak in work demand. It's by half calving each year, you're halving the number of cows calving and really spreading that, that workload out more. And that system actually is, is the one that most closely matches our feed supply profile or closely matches the, the current feed demand profile for our traditional spring calving, 12-month calving interval system. And in terms of batch robotic milking, I guess just to, to add some context around that, that's not looking at voluntary milking. That's kind of the, how people are most familiar with robotic milking at the moment. The idea here is how can we redesign our system that allows current robotic technology to allow us to milk in batches of cows? So, so sort of the same idea of our conventional milking system where you bring the herd in and it milks it and then you take them back to the paddock rather than that voluntary milking where cows are, are milking themselves throughout a 24-hour period. Talk to us about some of the other global competitors that we are going to be assessing. Sure. So um, US mega dairies were, were kind of picked first. There's a few different reasons for that, but we had some experience in, in those systems to begin with, and there's some, some good evidence out there about their low cost of production and ability to scale that kind of Lee touched on. The next one we'll look at is milk alternatives and, and seeing, well, um, actually, are they a competitor or not? Because that, that is still a standing question. And then if the answer is yes, then again, that same exercise of going, well, okay, where, where does our product need to get to in order to be more competitive with, with them? So those are the two that we've kind of got planned at the moment. But then we'll, once we've done those, cast our eye to what other competitors are there out there. Or, or equally, flipping it around, again, like, like Lee kind of talked about earlier, of where are our strengths? and really making sure that as time goes on and context change, that we don't erode those strengths and can really can really capitalise on them as well. So 
Mm. Hey, for farmers who are interested in keeping up to date with the research, how can they do that, Paul? Is there a website? Yep, so um, keep an eye out for your April dish of Inside Dairy. There's a good story there summarising kind of uh, some of the stuff we've been working on and uh, Farmers Forum coming up in uh, late April. We've got a session there as well as keep an eye out on your, in your, um, on social media or uh, in your inbox. At some point in the near future, we'll start giving people the ability to, to sign up to an email distribution list where you can receive updates for, for, for what we're working on in the project. Um, in particular, that extended lactation system we talked about earlier, we, we're setting up a pilot at Scott Farm kicking off next season. We will try and uh, release the, that regular kind of flow of information about what's happening on that farmlet. And so people can really yeah, f- follow what's happening and, and get an understanding of how that, that system is performing. Because it is really pushing the frontier, you know, 24 month carving into a lot of people kind of look at that and go, well, that's out there. I'm not sure it's going to work. And, th- and that really is the point of this project is to test out these ideas where there is a great deal of uncertainty about whether that system would work and, and, and how it would play out. Speaking of that Inside Dairy cover story, uh, that, that's you, Colin, you're, you're in that story. <laughs> hey, so you talk in that story about how excited your kids, Thomas and Michaela, are about farming in the future. What do you think farming might look like uh, by the time they're running the farm? Yeah, it uh, again, crystal ball gazing. They um, so you ask, I asked Thomas and Michaela about that because they are the ones that want to be parting part of farming with what they believe farming will be then. So, so they believe that, and sitting down with them, they believe Thomas certainly thinks there's going to be a lot of robotics. There's going to be a lot of uh, technology over machinery, a lot of wearable technology on cows. Kayla wants to be ensured that the cows are happy at all times, so that wearable technology is important to her. Robotics around to assist with milking. There will be technology in the, in the field to help with understanding rainfall, pasture growth, soil composition. And then also, and it was something Michaela brought up, was being connected with the customer. She's really excited to be able to go out and show everyone in the world our cow, Leone. We've got a cow, Leone, and uh, she's done well for us. And Michaela would love to show her to the world, uh, let the consumers know that she, she's doing good things on the farm, what it's, what it's doing, how it's doing, um, and having those consumers directly connected with the farm on, on effectively on a daily basis. So, um, yeah, and they also... They, they are mindful about the environment. So uh, Thomas wants to make sure that there is still recreational hunting available. So forestry to allow that to occur and wetlands to allow that to occur. We're also mindful that it's probably, we're going to be more productive around our good pasture. And so therefore the marginal pasture will see opportunities to divert that, that land into other revenue streams. Uh, we're fortunate, North Waikato, there's solar panels are, are starting to become a, a talking point because Auckland is requiring more renewable energy. So um, those sort of opportunities will present themselves over the next 20 or 30 years. But in saying that, Thomas, in five years' time, is 18. So, so it might be less than uh, 20 or 30 years. It could quite easily be as, as soon as five, six years' time. So, yeah, it's exciting. Very cool. Hey, well, just a couple more questions. Lee, are you optimistic that we can address the challenges uh, from our global competitors? Yeah, I am. I think that the dairy sector's got a long, a long, proud history of innovating to, to, to meet the challenge of our global competitors. But I also think that we've got to be realistic around the old adage that if we keep doing what we've always done, we'll keep getting what we've always got. And I think the reality is that that what we've always got might not be fit for purpose as we move forward. So I think we do have to be bold and innovative uh, in our thinking around how we're going to you know, keep our, our industry positioned well for the future. I think Colin's, I think Colin's got a good point that we don't always necessarily, um, we don't have to operate in the same competitive environment as, as our US cousins, but if we don't keep an eye on what we're doing, we might end up there by default. And I guess that's the risk is that if we don't keep on top of our game and keep pushing the boundaries, we will end up with a product that we can't sell as being different and we end up being in the same commoditized pool where we're going to be competing on all the things that we think that we might struggle with. So, so yeah, absolutely. We've got to keep our eye on the ball and this is where a project like the Frontier Farms comes into play because Dairy NZ, with the help of farmers like Colin and input from others, 
we're giving ourselves a chance to really test the boundaries of what we think might be possible today with a view that that might help us understand what we need to be doing tomorrow. Yeah, fantastic. Paul, just to finish, what part of Frontier Farms makes you the most excited? The thing that excites me most is really been given the license to, to test some of these kind of out there ideas out. The value in this project is the learning of potentially why things haven't worked just as much as why why they have worked. It's quite exciting to be able to push those boundaries. Equally, it's a bit daunting as well. You know, there's a lot of different views out there about what the future is going to look like and what priorities should be and, and things like that. And so people will challenge us on whether we're focusing on the right things. And, and, and I guess um, I welcome that. And this project is about facilitating that discussion about our future systems that that Lee put so very eloquently just before. Like the project will be doing its job if we're having more and more conversations like this. Fantastic. Thanks, Paul. And thank you so much, Lee and Colin, also for joining us on the podcast today. We really appreciate you giving up your time to talk to us about Frontier Farms. Thanks for tuning into Talking Dairy. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you'd like to check out more of our podcasts, go to dairynz.co.nz forward slash podcast or find us on your favourite podcast platforms. Catch you next time.